Hi everyone, welcome to part two of the Interpreting Myeloma Tests lectures. Uh, this is the case studies. So we're going to go straight into it. So you're on your ward round, you've got several patients who, uh, big surprise, have all had myeloma screens. So we'll start with patient A. You have a 77 year old male admitted with severe back pain and general malaise and fatigue. His HB is 90, so a little bit low. Creatinine's up at 220. MRI spine shows an osteomyelitis of L3. So have a look at the results and see if this explains the results, i.e. does he have myeloma or not, which is really what we're asking here. So just pause the lecture and take a second to have a look. So let's have a closer look. So the IgG is very slightly high out of range, as is the IgA and the M. There's no band detected, so we know there's no clone, but all of them are a bit up. Serum-free light chains also mildly elevated, both kappa and lambda, which means that the ratio is staying the same. So this is a polyclonal rise. This is the immune system trying to fight the infection. Lots of different plasma cells pumping out lots and lots of different immunoglobulins. So this is what we would call a polyclonal hyperglobulinemia. So things that can cause this are chronic infections. So we've seen our man with osteomyelitis, other things like endocarditis, HIV related infections, and pretty much any chronic infection really. Chronic liver disease, so cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis, these can cause um, a rise in globulins. Autoimmune disease, this is a big one. Rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, whatever. All of them can cause this. And malignancy. Lung, gastric and liver are three more common ones for this, but pretty much any malignancy can cause this rise in immunoglobulins. So let's get straight into patient B. It's a 55 year old lady who's seen by her GP for ongoing anemia. She's been treated with iron tablets, but has shown no improvement in her hemoglobin. It's quite commonly seen this. She's then admitted with abdominal pain. Calcium is high at 2.9 and her hemoglobin is pretty low at 83. GP had sent a myeloma screen, not yet had her follow up. So have a quick look at the screen and pause the lecture if you want. And let's see what you think. Big question, is this myeloma? So look at the immunoglobulins themselves. The G is very high, so 37.6, but the A and the M you'll notice are both very low. An M band has been detected with a paraprotein of 34.3, so we know there's a clonal paraprotein. The serum free light chains are also completely abnormal. The kappa shows a high level. Lambda is pretty normal in comparison, so this is kappa restriction. The kappa lambda ratio is 125, so it looks like there's a clone of cells that are all pumping out kappa light chains. So this is myeloma. The clues are your high immunoglobulin G, your paraprotein that tells you it's monoclonal. The fact that the other immunoglobulins are low, this is something called immunoparesis and is common in myeloma. It's one of the explanations as to why the patients are immunocompromised because the immunoglobulin they do have is usually clonal and therefore non-functional and the other immunoglobulins are very low. The serum free light chain is showing a very high kappa lambda ratio and this is more evidence of clonality. If we think back to slim crab, our criteria from the first lecture, we have a myeloma defining event which is the serum free light chains of a ratio of over 100 and end organ damage. The HB is low, suggesting that the bone marrow has become infiltrated and the calcium is high, suggesting bone damage. So next steps, what you're going to do with your plan from the ward round. Blood tests, albumin, LDH and a beta 2 microglobulin, all very useful because they help stage the patient's myeloma. You'll need to get some imaging. So the NICE guidelines uh, gold standard is for whole body MRI or PET. If you don't have access to those, then you can use a low dose whole body CT. Skeletal surveys very, very commonly used to be done. They've fallen very much out of fashion as these other better modalities have increased um, in availability. 
but if the patient declines any 3D imaging or is unsuitable for it, then you can consider a skeletal survey and you're going to contact haematology as well. Okay, so patient C. We have an 83 year old male admitted with constipation and mild low back pain. So HB is a little on the low side, creatinine's 137. That's for an 83 year old male, that's not that low necessarily. Calcium's fine at 2.44. He's been a smoker before, but otherwise pretty, pretty sprightly for his age. So have a quick look, pause the lecture if you want, and answer the question, is this myeloma? So when we have a look, he does have an M band. His proteín is 2.9. But none of the IGs are necessarily raised, but at a guess just from this, I would say his IgG is probably the main cause. It's a little on the towards the higher side of the normal range. His serum free light chains, again, very slightly out of range towards lambda, but really nothing to um, to really comment on here. So this is going to be a monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance. So he's got a very small paraprotein. He's got no real end organ damage. This is very common to have a small paraprotein. About 3% of the population over 50 will have one. It's a tenth of that less than 50. And as we get older, that in prevalence will increase decade on decade. His risk of progression to myeloma is between half to 1% per year. So that's worth bearing in mind with these patients. They do need monitoring. So just a quick note about the immunoglobulin number. So traditionally, immunoglobulin was used as a myeloma criteria, and the magic number to remember was 30 when I was at medical school. So less than 30 was not myeloma, above 30 was. If you think back to the slim crab criteria from the first lecture, it's not necessarily required for a diagnosis of myeloma to have that immunoglobulin above 30. However, the 30 grams per litre number for the immunoglobulin is still used to differentiate MGUS and smouldering myeloma. So smouldering myeloma is a term used for myeloma that's got no end organ damage, but is in a state where it's highly likely to progress to active myeloma. If it's more than 30 grams per litre, let's say on, on this blood test with this gentleman that's got no symptoms and no signs of end organ damage on his bloods, you would want to do some imaging to ensure there's no lesions because then we're looking at myeloma defining disease and he might require treatment. Let's move on to patient D. So we have a 46 year old female admitted with fatigue and weight loss. She's otherwise fit and well. Creatinine is a little bit high, but nothing too drastic here. HB is low, it's very low actually, 76. Calcium's normal, no pain, but she does have a palpable spleen on examination. And we'll say she's got no lymph nodes palpable in her neck, her armpits, or her groin. Have a look at the myeloma screen and tell me what you think. Does she have myeloma? So when we have a look, the G and the A are both within normal limits. But the M is very high, 35.6. An M band is detected and she's got a paraprotein of 31.9 grams per litre. The light chains, are, they're fine. So IgM myeloma is really rare. So think about what it might be more likely to be. So it's much more likely to represent lymphoproliferative disorder. So the most commonly found one is Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia or various other non-Hodgkin lymphomas can have IgM paraproteins. You can have an IgM MGUS, just as we had with our previous patient with an IgG MGUS. So a paraprotein without any organ damage. Does that apply to our lady? Well, she's quite anemic and she's got a big spleen. So I think things may have progressed beyond um, level where we're just happy to simply monitor. So the next steps in these patients, especially imaging is really essential. So rather than a PET scan, you can do a CT neck, chest, abdomen and pelvis to assess the lymph nodes in the spleen. Though many will end up with a PET scan at some point. 
you can do LDH viral screening, the beta 2 microglobulin, and really important with these patients is plasma viscosity, especially if they're symptomatic. So if you think back to the first lecture, and we looked at the structure of those immunoglobulins, the IgM is a pentamer, it's five molecules all put together. So when there's a high amount of this in the blood, it really thickens it. Think of it like treacle going around your blood system. So this thick treacly blood can cause strokes and heart attacks just from poor flow. So symptoms before those happen will be blurred vision, headaches, poor memory. So you need to really ask about these, get the viscosity and make sure there's nothing urgent that needs to be done. And as before, you would contact hematology with these patients. So patient E. So we have a 55 year old male referred in by his GP. He's had a blood test because he's been very tired recently. His urea is a bit high, but that creatinine, look at that, that's pretty high. He's otherwise well with no past medical history. His calcium's normal, he's got no pain. So when we have a look at the screen, we can see that the immunoglobulins are all within normal limits. No band has been detected, so he does not have a paraprotein. However, that kappa light chain level is very high. And he's got a ratio of 120. So when we think back to slim crab criteria, this is diagnostic of, of myeloma potentially. So what would you do next? Well, really, you do the same as you did with the other patient that had the paraprotein and the strong suggestion of myeloma. So you would treat this as myeloma and contact hematology. This is light chain myeloma. Not commonly seen, but the reason I put it in is because it is easily missed. And it does show the importance here of using both the basic myeloma screen and the serum free light chain screen as well. Last patient. So we have a 63 year old male admitted to ENT with a nasal obstruction from a mass. He's had a biopsy and the biopsy shown plasma cells, which was not expected. And we can see why it wasn't expected when we look at the myeloma screen because it's, it's pretty normal, isn't it? So does he have myeloma or doesn't he? So let's have a look at his imaging. He's got a PET scan on the left and you can see the area that's lit up so towards the bottom of the image that's the bottom of his brain and we expect that to light up because the brain uses lots of glucose and it's radioactive glucose that lights up in PET scans. The bit that's lit up at the front towards his nose that shouldn't be there and that's where the mass is. If we then look at the two MRI scans I've taken two different slices from the same patient and you can see in the nasal cavity there's a big lump that's not supposed to be there that's a big ball of plasma cells. The rest of the scans were normal, so this would be a solitary plasma cytoma. So you would need to work these patients up pretty thoroughly, and they would definitely need a bone marrow. And you would be looking for any of the myeloma defining disease or end organ damage. With a solitary lesion, you can treat it with radiotherapy. If there's more than one plasma cytoma, however, things do change. Either way, you're going to refer to hematology. And that's it. So myeloma and its related conditions are quite complex and often not very well understood. So I'm hoping that I've shed some light on those things and that we can help interpret those screens in the future and help you think about what you're going to do with your plans. I will note that I haven't spent any time at all talking about amyloidosis, which is an extremely complex topic. But if you are interested in this area, then please do look up um, up to date. It's a very good resource. Thanks for listening.